So if you got your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5. We're going to be continuing in Deuteronomy. And so as we continue our study of Deuteronomy, in chapter 5, we're going to find Moses, he's in a familiar situation. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about, um, in Deuteronomy 4, about Moses is addressing the nation of Israel, right? He's, he's reminding them of some things, and that's where we're at again. Moses is he's about to address Israel again, reminding them of where, where they have been and what God has done in their life. And so it starts with Moses rehashing some of his most famous work, right? So he's going to lay out the Mosaic Covenant and the terms and conditions of it, which are the, the Ten Commandments, right? So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I'm going to try to break it down as practically as possible. So we're going to look at um, first at how, uh, or we'll, we're going to look at a reminder of the covenant that Israel made with God, or that God made with Israel. And so we're, there's a couple of real practical things that we're going to take out of the first verse there. And then the second thing we're going to look at is the Ten Commandments, and particularly how they relate to the New Testament church, right? So let's pray before we jump into this, and, uh, and then we'll get started. Lord, we come before you. This morning, um, it's man, it feels good out. Thankful for the breeze and for the shade. I pray that um, you would just speak, Lord, through your word. God, as we open up your book, I pray that it would, uh, that your spirit would speak to us, God, and that we would have exactly what we need, uh, Lord, to take from this. Lord, I pray that we would not leave the same way in which we uh, came, came here, God. Uh, if we're not being changed, if we're not being transformed by your word, Lord, uh, we're wasting our time. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, God, and that we would have ears and hearts to receive it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And just so you know, um, there's, gonna, there's a, a lot of Bible flipping today. So, Deuteronomy 5 is your home base, but we're going to... Uh, I'm guilty of always want, man, I always want to make sure that we're reading what the Word of God says, and I don't want to give you my opinion, right? So we're going we're gonna to do a lot of Bible flipping. Usually I rely on a screen, but there's no screen today, right? So you're going to have to actually uh, open your Bible, or if you're like most of my students, just use your, use your phone, right? Use your device and uh, follow along with me. But we're going to be hanging out in Deuteronomy 5, so keep, make sure you keep a hand there if I tell you to flip somewhere else. So Deuteronomy 5, verse 1, it says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ear this day, that you may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid by reason of the fire and went up into the mount. All right, so we're going we're gonna to pump the brakes there. Um, so let's, let's look at just before we jump into, there's going to be a lot of teaching today. Uh, because this, this section, we got to understand some things if we're going to be able to walk through it properly. So there's going to be a lot of teaching, but I want to start with something really practical uh, that we can learn from the very first verse. It says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ear this day, that you may learn them and keep them and do them. Right? So we need to, we need to be, uh, we need to, to heed to this, to learn, keep, and do the statutes of the Lord, the judgments and statutes. We need to keep the word of God uh, in our hearts so that we can do them. So Moses instructs Israel to learn, keep, and do the statutes and judgments. So let's kind of break this down a little bit. So learning, what is learning? It's knowledge. We got to learn some things, right? So um, this, is, uh, this takes personal responsibility. You're responsible for learning. Right. Um, if you want to, if you want to learn in life, it's it, it really comes down to you. People can teach you stuff all day long, but if you're not willing to, to learn it, it's just going to go in one ear and out the other. That that really kind of defines my high school in a nutshell. It just went in one ear and out the other because I I didn't take any personal responsibility to learn. 
uh, the things that I needed to. But uh, so I want to kind of use an analogy here to teach this a little bit. I love analogies. Um, I love how God uses, he gives us the physical world. Uh, and in a lot of ways we can, we can use that to parallel a spiritual reality that he wants to teach us, right? Um, because as a child of God, we are responsible to know what God requires of us and desires of us. That's your responsibility. You're God's chi- if you say that you're a Christian, then you're God's child. And as a result, we need to know, we need to know what he requires and desires of us, right? So here's the, here's the analogy. My children, they learn my expectations uh, because I'm their father. And, and from a very young age, they learn uh, what, what is expected of them from mom and dad right if they don't commit to memory uh what then they're going to suffer the consequences what we desire for them right like we have we have expectations if you're a wilson right then you, this is this is the way that you're going to like you're going to represent the wilson family because you know my my dad used to always tell me this uh you're you're whenever you go out of this house you, you represent christ and you represent the wilson name Right. So we had we had expectations of how we were going to live and and how we were going to carry ourselves as long as we lived under uh, I lived under my mom and dad's roof. Right. So I had to learn real quick. And so I've we, we now have expectations for our kids. Right. They're 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 living under our house, under our rules. So they have to learn those. Right. And so these are they're not mandates for the sake of authority and discipline. Right. We're not making the we don't we don't set these expectations because we're trying to be authoritarians over them. And what I say goes, but because we want what's best for them. Right. It's not about because I said so. It's about because that's what's best for you. Right. So we we set parameters for them the way that we we choose to uh, raise our children. And we think that that's what's best for our child. Right. And so we lay down the parameters for their good. It's not, it's not to be authoritarians. Um, and so as parents, we know what's best for our kids. And the same thing goes for God, right? He's our, if we call him our father, right, he knows what's best for us. I, I say that a lot because I think that the simplicity of that statement is often overlooked. We, we, we sometimes forget that God knows what's best for us, you know, um, and so Proverbs 4, 4, it tells us this. It says, he taught me also and said unto me, thine heart, uh, let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. It's really that simple, right? We, we need to know what God expects of us and desires from us. And, if we, and, and that's, that's where we're going to find life, okay? Um, and so a quick note on learning uh, before we move on to the next part. Like, man, we are such a blessed church, We're such a blessed body because uh, we're very fortunate to have the resources available to us that we have here at HBC. Um, There there are countless opportunities for us to learn what God expects for us. If we need to learn the Bible, man, you're in the right place because at this church we wholeheartedly believe in teaching you how to follow Jesus. And we believe the fundamental of that is learning what God God expects from you. We, We need to learn the Word of God so that we can live out what God has called us to, okay? And so we're very fortunate to be in a, in a place where we can we have easy access to this. So for starters, if you're a born-again believer, uh, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, right? And so the Bible says it's spiritually discerned. And, and fortunately for us, we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us, and he will begin to teach you the Word of God as you begin to open it up and daily read it, right? There's a couple of verses if you want to check them out in 1 John 2 that talk about this. In 1 John 2, 20 and 27, it talks about how we, uh, we don't need a teacher. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us, right? But praise God that we do have teachers. Praise God that we do have discipleship. That's the first thing that we offer for someone who maybe you're a, you, you just met Jesus. Or maybe you've, you met Christ when you were a, a, a little kid, but then you, you don't know the Bible. Well, we offer discipleship for you. And discipleship is, is where we do life with the fellow believer, right? They teach you how to follow Jesus as you walk together through the Bible. It's amazing, right? The same way that, I, that, that me and Deidre teach our kids, we, walk with the, we do life with them. And, and, we, and we, share, we share our word for them. And, and they, they begin to learn it because they're doing life with us, right? We offer ministry tools and training, we, D2, right, where we teach you to study the Bible for yourself, and we equip you with uh, the tools necessary to serve and lead a ministry, right? 
That, that's, that's an amazing resource that we have available. We offer LFBI, Living Faith Bible Institute, where you can get a deeper understanding of the Bible, right? There's a two-year uh, essentials uh, track where you can just learn that you want to go a little bit deeper in the Bible, right? There's an overview of the Bible. There's key doctrinal studies on major books of the Bible, right, that, that you really need to know. I think, it, I think every believer should have the, man, like, it would be great if we could all go through that stuff because it's just, it's, it's, a, it's really good to have that, that basic Bible knowledge, man. That way, whenever we go to speak to the lost, we have an answer to every man. The Bible tells us to have an answer for everyone, you know? And, and so it's, we need to take that personal responsibility. We don't want to push it off on, on our pastor or on someone else. I want to be able to answer right in the moment when, when someone has a uh, question. So we, we have those available to us. And then if you, if you want to go a little bit further, w- there's two more years of pastoral training, right? Maybe you feel like God is calling you to be a church planner. Maybe you feel like God is calling you to be a missionary. Maybe you just you want to be ready for whatever God has for you in life. And that's my personal testimony. Uh, I felt like the Lord was calling, leading me to sign up for some classes at LFBI just to be ready. Whatever God wants to do with me, right? I want to be, I want to be equipped and trained up. And so we have these avenues. Uh, we have Bible studies going on all the time. So there are ample opportunities for, for us as members of HBC to, to know the Word of God, right? And so I think it's safe to say if you don't know the Word of God, it's, it's your own fault. We, we provide the, the, the necessary resources and tools. And so, man, some, some of us need to hear that today. We need to take personal responsibility to learn the book, right? Because that's God's word to us today. If we want to know what God desires and expects of us, all we got to do is read, read and study the word of God. And it's, it's really that simple. Is my mic, like, really making funky noises? It's driving me nuts. Can you mute that? Okay, maybe that's a little better. So let's go back to the analogy. I just wanted to, I just wanted to let you guys know if you, if you are have a hunger to learn the Word of God, man, we have we have the net, we have what you need, okay, um, and you have it in your hand probably if you have a phone or if you have a Bible. Um, so let's go back to this child analogy uh, because if my children learn what is expected of them, they don't have to question, right? They know what's expected of them. Uh, it's not a surprise when they get in trouble because they understand. They, it's been clearly laid out through my, mine and my wife's word. We, we've laid it out, so it's, it's not a surprise. So they, when they, as they learn what is expected of them through time and time again, reminding them and telling them, uh, it makes it so much easier for them to be able to keep it. Uh, so to keep, that's like to observe and, and, and it's to conform. So we're observing it and we're conforming to it. So this requires you to retain possession of what you're learning. Okay, learning is cool, but like I've learned a lot of stuff in my life. That's a big, that's something that I really love to do is learn. Um, And so I'll be learning like five different things. But the problem with that is I'm not keeping any of it. I'm just learning about it. And then I want to make room for more to learn more. And then I, I don't keep it. That's not what God's calling us to do. Right. Like sitting under a class one time where we talk about something, that's not learning it. That's just that that's the start of the learning process but you need to keep it right so uh, as as my kids learn they begin to keep or observe what is taught to them and so here's an example we teach our children don't run out into the street i mean i'm sure that's a pretty common uh, a pretty common ground rule in, in homes is hey don't run out in the street because there's a probability of you getting run over by a car um, and, and so it's, it's hard for a kid to understand that because if the ball goes out in the street, they just want to get it. They don't, they don't care that there's potentially a, 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 a car is going to come out and get them. They, they just want the ball. And so at a young age, they don't understand that, that why they shouldn't do that. And so they may not fully understand why they shouldn't run out into the street. However, they have learned that it is best for them uh, to ask for help or, for, or permission before they do that right uh they they understand that they're going to have to uh it's going to take several warnings and a few spankings for them to get it in their mind not to run out into the street no matter what right because uh, you know we don't discipline because we like it it's not fun to discipline 
I don't know if you know that or not, but it's not fun to have to, uh, to, have to spank your child or to have to get on to them and to discipline them. But we do that as a way of, of training them to, like, to, to not do what they know not to do, right? If there's no consequences for their actions, they're, go- they're gonna do whatever they want, right? And so we choose to discipline uh, according, to, according to the way God laid out for us in the word. And as, as after receiving the correction, they now know not to do it, right? They, they don't go out on the road because they know, it, they, they, they begin to, they're beginning to understand, if I do this, there's a consequence. If I disobey mom and dad's word, there's a consequence for my action and the reason that they need to know there's a consequence is because they're not, they, they're not going to be able to get away with it, right? And, and so this is God's principle to us. If we begin, if, if we just do whatever we want, then, man, it, it's going to end up not good for us, right? Like, that's why he lays the parameters, because he knows that it's not good for us to do the things that he tells us not to do, right? I don't know. I, I, whenever I was younger, I just... Uh, I, I didn't understand that concept. I thought that God was just the fun police and he didn't want me to do the things that I wanted to do. I didn't realize they were actually what was best for me, right? And so uh, I know that's just a silly example. However, over time, this obedience goes from something they're learning to something that they just do second nature. It becomes a, it becomes a habit for them. Just the other day, uh, my son threw a ball across the road or something and he ran out into the, he was running, about to go out there and then he stopped and looked back to see if he could do it. Like he was, he was looking for permission to go get his ball because he understood, like it, it was it, it's so ingrained in, in, in his nature now that he knows I'm not gonna do that, right? Um, so it becomes an action. Doing becomes the action of our life. So this requires you to live out what you have learned and kept uh, through all the learning and the process of keeping and now becomes something uh, that, that you do. It becomes an instinct. It becomes instinctive. So as a child of God, we must be diligent to learn and keep the word of God. We want God's word so deeply ingrained in us that the only thing that is left for us to do is to be conformed to it. Romans uh, 12.2 tells us to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So God begins, as we uh, conform, like read the word of God, it conforms us to his image. It transforms us to his image, and we become instinctively like him. The Bible tells us in Galatians 5 verses 22 through 25 that uh, if we're walking in the spirit of God, we will produce fruit. And that's love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, right? We'll begin to manifest the fruit of the spirit in our life. And these aren't things that nat- come natural to this guy, right? Uh, it's not natural for me to be a loving guy. And, and all the, those, that fruit. So, so as we uh, allow God's word to get inside of us, we begin to be molded and shaped to his image. And so that's when the doing becomes instinctive and second nature. And that's what's awesome about, uh, about is we have access to the word of God. Okay, um, it's, it's readily available to us. We just have to put in the work necessary to, to do, to keep and to learn. Okay, so that was a practical part. So let's move on to the covenant. So now uh, Moses reminds them of the covenant that they made with God at Mount Sinai or Horeb, right? That's the mountain. Uh, Those two are the same, one and the same. So go to verse 2 of Deuteronomy 5. He's going to rehash this covenant with them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talked with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. I stood before the Lord and you at this time to show uh, you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid by reason of the fire and went not up into the mount. Right. So Moses is reminding the nation of Israel of the covenant they entered into upon uh, with God upon the receiving of the Ten Commandments. Um, and so here's a, we're going to we're going to take a little break break from the preaching and we're going to start some teaching here uh, because we're going to we need a we need a little word on the covenants. These are some basic or some some Bible concepts that we've got to understand that are really important for us to walk through this passage. So we're going to uh, take a brief look. And, and when I say brief, I mean a brief look at, at the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants. And we call those that because of uh, God made he, when he made a covenant with Abraham. It's just easy to call it the. Abrahamic covenant, right? Pretty simple. Uh, and we call it the Mosaic covenant because God made this covenant 
uh, through Moses for the people, right? So it's just, these are the guys that, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to study out these covenants, you, you can remember Abrahamic, oh, that has to do with Abraham. Mosaic, oh, that has to do with Moses, right? So, so those are, that's why I'm going to call them that. Um, so, so a note on this, again, this is very brief, and, and it's much more complex than we have the time to get into today. So I would encourage you to study these out on your own. They're very important uh, for us uh, to, to understand. And so I would encourage you to study that out. Um, the Mosaic Covenant is essentially a continuation of the Abrahamic Covenant. Um, I think it is super important to have a basic understanding of the Abrahamic com- uh, covenant so that we can understand the covenant that God made with Israel. Okay, so here, let's, let's do a, a brief rundown of this Abraham, the covenant with Abraham. Uh, so, hold your place in Deuteronomy. Go to Genesis chapter 12. Get, get, get your fingers warmed up. We're going to be kind of breezing through some, some uh, references here. Genesis chapter 12. And, and we're going to start looking through uh, some of the some of the, the terms of the covenant with, with Abraham. So Genesis 12, verse 2, it says, And I will make of thee a great nation, God to Abraham here, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It's a really important reference right there. Think about in today's uh, in today's world, what is happening to the what has happened or or is happening to the nations that have turned their back on Israel. The Bible says that He's going to bless them that bless thee, curse them, uh, and, and and curse them that curse thee. Right, and that's still happening today. Uh, just just look in the Middle East. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Flip to five five chapters over Genesis 17. Genesis 17, verse 1. It says, And when Abraham was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall my name be, uh, or neither shall thy name any more be Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make uh, thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant that's an important phrase right there to be a god unto thee and to thy seed after thee and i will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of canaan for an everlasting possession and i will be their god and god said unto abraham thou shalt keep my covenant therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations so that's that's god's covenant with abraham so quick recap God is going to make a great nation of out, out of Abraham. God will bless Abraham's descendants. And Abraham's descendants were promised land for an everlasting possession. That's really important. And it's through this, it's through this people group that God chose to bring his, his Messiah. It's through, the, it's through this pagan man, Abram, that God chose to set apart for himself he made, he made his very own people group. And, and as a result of this moment in history, we are here today. Again, because Jesus came out of this lineage, right? So let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, we're going to fast forward to Moses' day. And so God delivers Israel from Egypt in remembrance of this covenant that he made with Abraham. So uh, go to Exodus 2. So flip a, a book over, find the second chapter of Exodus we're going to be in Exodus for the next couple of references. So um, Exodus 2, 24, it says, And God heard their groaning. We're talking about the nation of Israel. They're in Egypt. They're groaning. And God, heard, God hears them groaning. And, he rem- and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. So God remembers a promise that he made. He's going to get these people to their land. Exodus 6, verse 2. 
Exodus 6. It says, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I am also established, and I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept uh, keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. God doesn't forget his covenants. It's very important. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and, and with, a great judgment, with great judgment. And I will take you uh, to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall uh, know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out uh, from under the burden of the Egyptians burdens of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob and I will give it you uh, yeah give it you for an heritage I'm the Lord so God remembers this covenant that he had made and so he delivers the people and he sends and he sends Moses to, to do this right and so now God has delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt and he makes a covenant with them at Mount Sinai, right? So Moses has delivered the people um, and, and he's getting ready to give these people a covenant, right? So through the Mosaic covenant, God promises the nation of Israel that if they will, that they will be a special nation to him among all the nations of the earth. Uh, but here's the kicker. This, this covenant is situational. It is, it is essentially a terms, uh, an agreement. There's a terms in it of agreement for this relationship. And if they will keep the law, God promises them uh, prosperity and protection. However, if they break the covenant, uh, they will be exiled from their land, right? So Exodus 19, verse 1. I'll let you get there, Exodus 19. And this is going to kind of lay out a little bit of it. There's, um, I'm going to have to turn my back a little bit. It's kind of weird, but I don't want you guys to have to hear the that so uh exodus this covenant is laid out all throughout exodus right i mean it goes from exodus 19 to 34 there's a lot of terms there's a lot of things going on there because because the law is actually the 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 entire law is is this covenant right but um i like to think of the ten commandments as the synthesis of that right so exodus 19 verse 1 it says in the third month when the children of israel were gone forth out of the land of egypt the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they uh, were departed uh, from Rephidim and were come uh, to the desert of Sinai and pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God. And this, so this is exact, the exact reference that Moses is referring to in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the, nation, uh, out of the mountain, saying, Thus uh, shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, If uh, ye have seen uh, what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a, a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So you see that if, if then statement? That's a conditional, that's a condition. If then, okay? Uh, verse 6 And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words uh, which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all of these words which the Lord commanded them, commanded him. And, and all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. So the people receive this word. They, they receive the, this promise and they say, Yeah, we're going to keep it. Like whatever he says, we're going to do that. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So Moses goes back to the Lord and says, yeah, they agree, right? They shook hands. They, 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 they made this covenant uh, official. And the Lord said unto Moses, lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear uh, when I speak unto thee and, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Okay, so I know that's a lot of teaching, but let's just sum it up. The Abrahamic covenant, uh, God calls out a people uh, and promises them a land. 
right? This covenant is eternal, and this is based on God's promise. It's so so it's a it's an eternal thing. God made this promise, and it doesn't matter what the Jewish people do. It doesn't matter what the nation of Israel do. God made this promise, and it's an eternal one. But the Mosaic covenant, God lays out the terms uh, of of their covenant relationship uh, with the law, right? So this covenant is conditional. It's based on Israel's uh, promise to keep it. Uh, spoiler alert: they don't they don't keep their promise very well. They're kind of like you and me. Uh, they, 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 they didn't keep their end of the agreement. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this takes us to the, uh, to the terms and conditions of, of God's chosen people. So go back to, to Deuteronomy 5. This, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments, right? And I, and I know I, I should have a felt board up here. You probably, if you've been in church for, uh, like I was, I re- was raised in church. We had like felt boards and, and you'd put up the stories, you know, and the Ten Commandments. They had like a... I don't know, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit. Now they just probably have TVs or something that you, you put them, the pictures up. But in my day, it was a felt board, so let's move on. I'm losing track of my thoughts. So Deuteronomy 5, 6. Sorry, I, I, I can chase rabbits all day long uh, if they're there. So Deuteronomy 5, 6, it says, let's just read the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee uh, any graven image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am uh, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, Thou, nor thy sons, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates, that thy uh, manservant and thy maidservant may rest uh, as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee uh, out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be uh, prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou uh, bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou, uh, thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his maidservant, or his man, uh, his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Right. So, so God lists these ten commandments. So, if you maybe you, you lost track there, let's just lay them out. Um, and again, I just want to make this reminder: there is a huge portion of Scripture that is dedicated to the law of God. Right. So. Uh, man, there's countless areas where where God gives Moses uh, the law. Um, and, and a lot of that's found uh, there in uh, Exodus, right, or Deuteronomy, or sorry, Exodus, right? But anyways, we're, what we're going to look at is the Ten Commandments. So, uh, and they're as, as follows. So the first one, no, have no other God. Pretty simple. Don't worship idols. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie, don't covet. So th- those are the 10, that's like the synthesis of the law, right? In its most basic form, that's what, that's what God desires from his people. And so these, these 10 commandments are an incredible revelation for God's people. They don't have to wonder anymore, what does God expect for them? Before they had this, uh, they, they didn't know exactly what God wanted for them, but he, but he gave them his word so that they could know. They don't have to, they don't have to question um, they now have an understanding of, of what God expects from them. 
and, and not to mention when they lived it out, uh, it is without a doubt what is best for them, right? So if you flip any one of these commandments on its head, um, you, you're in a world for, uh, you're, you're for in for a world of hurt or, or discontent in life, right? And so here's what we got to understand. While these aren't directed at the New Testament believer directly, uh, they're most certainly worth committing to memory and living out daily, right? Because if we steal something, then we're going to go to jail, right? If, if we kill somebody, then we're going to go to prison and potentially worse than that, right? Depending on where, where you live at, you, you could get the death penalty. Um, and, and, it, and it's a good idea for us to keep the Sabbath, right? Uh, everyone needs rest and you can't go all the time uh, go work all the time and expect uh, to get things done if you never allow your body time to recoup right and and, and I think we a lot of us can uh, can take from that man we need to take a little bit of rest if we're just always working overtime uh, we're, we're not ever going to have any time to for our, our bodies and our minds to, to, to re, recharge a little bit, you know? So if we keep these, these 10 commandments, say we, we're, we're going to be better off for it, but we're not bound by them. Um, and so I would go, uh, I could go on and on about this, but I, I think you get the point. And so let's, let me lay out what God does expect from the new Testament believer. Um, and so let's look at, at the words that Jesus said concerning this. And what you're going to find is that really like, it's pretty similar, but uh, the, I love the I love the even more synthesized version of this. It's found in Matthew chapter 22, right? So so Jesus he's he's talking to these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, right? And and he's gonna they're gonna ask him this question. All right, what's the best? What's the greatest commandment? And and the answer that he gives them uh, is man that's where we need that's as as the new testament believer that's where we camp out that's that's what we do right so matthew 22 verse 34 it says but when the pharisees had heard that he had put the sadducees to silence they they were gathered together then one of them which was a lawyer asked him a question tempting him and saying master which is the great commandment of the law what's the best one jesus and so here's what Jesus said, verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the, this is the key verse. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Right? So what, he, what he's saying there is, if we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul and with all of our mind and in other references with all of our strength if we love god with everything in us man like we're he's going to give us a heart for the things that he loves we're going to develop a passion uh, for the things that he's about okay because we take on the nature of our father for, for better or for worse we're going to take on the nature of our father um, and, and so in this case it's for the best so we become, as we fall in love with God, we develop a heart for the things that God loves. And it says here that he loves people, right? And if we love people, then you can guarantee we're not going to steal from them, right? If, if we love people, we're not going to kill them, okay? Um, and, and if we love God, we're not going to be worshiping idols. And so what he's saying is love God and love your neighbor that that is that that's what god has called us to that's the commandment that we are to follow to love god with everything we've got and to love people okay one more reference for you you don't have to turn there just listen Revel uh, romans 13 verse 8 to 10 it says oh no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law for this and he's going to list, this is Paul, he's, he says for this, and he's going to refer to the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. So here's the summary of all of that. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Right. So so if we love God and we love people, we don't have to worry about what we do. Right. Because it's, it's going to come from a, a genuine place that God has given us to, of love for, for you know, th this is not a, a love that we can conjure up in and of ourselves. Right. I have to love God 
to get so that he can give me a heart to love his people right i love my wife because i because it's it's just easy right but it's harder for me to love people that i have no reason to love them right but whenever i have a heart like god's heart what did god do for the people for for the world he died for them he had such a love for them that he was willing to put himself to death for the sake of humanity and that only that kind of love can come from god it can't it, it's not self produced right and so um, that is, so love, it says here, uh, is the fulfilling of the law. Okay, the law th- that was never going to save us. The Ten Commandments, keeping that, doing those things, that's never going to save us. Man, you could be the best person in the world. You keep the Ten Commandments to a T, but that's not going to save you. Okay, the the law was ta- has taught us that we can never work our way to God. So we're gonna we're gonna do some more flipping. Uh, go to Romans three. I know I just told you not to turn there, but we're going back there. So I guess go ahead and turn there. Uh, Romans chapter 3. And if you've got a spare hand, I'm gonna be, I'm, we're going to go to Galatians 3 first. Um, but if not, just, just hang out Romans 3. I'll be there in a minute. Uh, but we're, I'm going to go to Galatians 3 and lay out a couple of verses, verse 24 and 25. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. So what he's saying there is, uh, Paul's telling us that the law was to teach us of our sin. It was our schoolmaster. It taught us uh, of our inadequacies, right? Because it's not long before, I mean, I I remember stealing uh, a a chocolate bar from from the grocery store, that's one of my first memories, right? Like it doesn't, it's not long before the heart of man, uh, the sin, the, the sin nature rears its ugly head. We can't save ourselves. We can't keep the law. And so it's our schoolmaster to teach us you can't do it. But verse 25 says, after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now we, ha- now we, we have faith in Jesus. Right, and so if you're in Romans three, let's let's read that reference, verse nineteen. It says, "Now we know uh, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the word uh, world may be guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin." He says, the sin, the, the, you, you know your sin because of the law. If you think you're a perfect person and that you're right with God in the flesh without Jesus, you need to go read, you know, you need to go read the law because he tells us that under the law, every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. You're guilty. You can't, you can't do good enough for God. You can't be good enough. You can't work your way to God. And that's great news. Right, But now, verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a, beauty, that's a beautiful thing. We can't do it. God knew that because all have sinned and fallen short. You're not special. Right? You're not, you're, you're not the most wicked person. Like, we're all wicked. We all have fallen short. Okay? Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood and to declare his righteousness to the remission, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. I declare, or to declare, I say, at this time is righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Uh, Why is boasting then? It is excluded. Uh, By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. If there was any questioning, should we keep the law? Should we live in faith? Uh, Paul tells us, hey, uh, we're justified by faith without the deeds of the law, right? That's amazing, right? The law, the law taught us that we needed God, 
but it also but but Christ set us free from the bondage of the law. Now now we're free to live in Christ by grace through faith, and that's uh, that's a, that's great news for us because we're not made right by God through our deeds. We're made right by faith in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And so here here's a couple of final thoughts for you today. The Abrahamic covenant showed us that God is a personal God and that he wants to bless the world through his people. Okay? He's a personal God. So this Abrahamic covenant, it's a literal covenant to the Jewish people, to Israel, right? But what it shows us as as is as the New Testament church is that he's a personal God. Man, he want he he wants to know you personally and he wants to bless the world through you. You know how you bless the world? By sharing, the, by sharing the gospel, by making disciples of all nations. And the Mosaic Covenant, it teaches us that we're incapable of saving ourselves through works. The blood of bulls and goats would never, could never cleanse us from our sin permanently, right? So that's why we needed the permanent sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We needed a new covenant, right? And so in Jesus, we have the sacrificial lamb that takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus, we are saved by grace through faith, not by keeping the law, right? And remember, our, this is what God expects from us is to love the Lord our God with everything we got and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's all you got to remember. If you, if you do those two things, man, I'm telling you, you've got it figured out. Um, and then so first, or let's, let's look at, I'll just read these references. John 1, 29, it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That sin that, 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 sin that the law shown in you, it's taken away through Jesus. That's amazing. So God's not going to hold us accountable. Uh, he, like our sin, it was paid for by Jesus. God's not going to, he's not going to pour his wrath out on us anymore. And then also, if you want to see a little bit more about this, go to Hebrews chapter 9. That's just for your own study. Uh, 8, 9, and 10, there's a lot of stuff to look at there. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9, this is, I mean, man, uh, this is a discipleship verse. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, man, I'm thankful for the new covenant. I'm thankful that, like, uh, we don't have to live under this religious system of, of do's and don'ts. We now have the freedom to live a life where the only, the only thing that we need to remember is to love God with everything we've got and to love our neighbor as ourselves. I'm telling you, because if you love the Lord, like... He's going he's gonna to push you to his word. And as he, as he pushes you to his word, he's going to ignite your heart for the things that he's about. And, a, and as that happens, it's going to become second nature because you're going to be learning, you're going to be keeping it, and then you're going to start doing it. And it becomes who you are as a person, right? Being a Christian is not about acting like one. I would hear that all the time as a young man. You need to act right. You need to act like a Christian. Well, how about we just become Christians? Because that literally means little Christ, how about we just become little Christ by, keep, by learning, keeping, and doing his word? So uh, the new covenant allows us to be the sons and daughter of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1.12 tells us this, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them to, that believe on his name. And so, man, maybe you're here today and, and you're trusting in works to save you. You're trusting that being a good person is, is, is going to get you into heaven before God one day. And I'm here to tell you it's not. Right? The only thing that's going to get you to heaven is, is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. And what's amazing about that is it's a free gift. Okay? And so, uh, man, maybe you're here today and you have been saved. Right? You do know the Lord. Uh, but you, you, you need to have a, a foundation for your faith. Right? You have Jesus, you have that foundation, but you need to start building on that foundation. Maybe you need to learn the Word of God. Maybe you need to get discipled. Or maybe you've been discipled before. Uh, man, maybe you need to get plugged into uh, ministry tools and training. I know that that's something that uh, we are really excited to get ramped back up. Come talk to, to one of us uh, pastors. Come talk to David. Talk to Tony. Uh, talk to me. We would love 
to set you up with uh, a way to, to move forward in your faith, to, to build on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And so um, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we love you so much. We, we thank you for your word. We don't have to question or wonder what you expect of us and what you desire from us, God. And, and it's just amazing that you've given it to us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would uh, just glean from what you've shown us today. Lord, the simplicity uh, of what you expect of us is just to love you and to love people. So, Lord, I pray that that, that would be our passion as a church. Lord, and I pray that... Uh, you just be with us as we as we scatter, Lord. I pray that we would take to heart what you've shown us and that we would live it out. And it's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen.